Hi, boys and girls, it's Miss Kelly, and it is week two of unit one, Cultivating Natural Resources. So let's get started. Today, you will need your Cultivating Natural Resources unit one booklet and a pencil. Okay, here are our learning goals for today. Some of the things that we're going to be doing throughout our lesson. We're going to practice our active listening ask questions before, during, and after reading, read with correct word recognition and understanding, develop vocabulary, use knowledge of long syllable, long vowel syllable patterns to read and pronounce words accurately, and consult print or digital reference materials to confirm the correct spelling and meanings of words. So we have a lot to get to today. Okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about is going to be in our Cultivating Natural Resources Unit 1 booklet, and we're going to be looking on pages 12 and 13. It looks like this, okay? It's called A Short History of a Special Plant, and we're going to be talking today about asking questions before during and after reading, and I'm going to be referring to this little chart here. Okay, and it looks like this and it tells us when we might ask questions and why we might ask questions when we're reading. So before I start to read the story, A Short History of a Special Plant, I wanna do what maybe in younger grades you called a picture walk, right? You might wanna just go through and just look over the story. I see the title. Right, I see uh, the picture here with a caption with it. I see headings. I see a diagram there that is labeled. On the next page, I see a map and a key. And then there's another map and a key. So that kind of puts in my brain a little bit of an idea of what it is that I'm going to be reading about, okay? I know that it's going to have something to do with, I see the map, so I'm thinking, hmm, I see some states on there that I might recognize. So it's going to have to do something with those states. Um, I see an outline of the United States. So it's going to have something to do with um, corn farming in the United States. Um, and when I look at this picture here in the caption, it says the Native Americans began cultivating corn more than 5,000 years ago. So I'm wondering, before I even read, I'm thinking to myself, hmm, I wonder if this story is going to be about where corn came from, how it became a grown as a crop, you know, how did Native American people start to grow corn for food and other uses? So before I read, um, I might ask questions uh, to set a purpose for my reading, to kind of focus my thinking, maybe to draw inferences or to sort of um, kind of put already in my head, what do I already know about this topic, right? What do I already know about the history of corn? Maybe I know a lot. Maybe I know nothing, right? During reading, as I'm reading, I might have a question about some information. There might be a word that I don't know. There might be something in the story that I find really interesting and that I want to know more about. And then after I'm done the story, I may be thinking back about the story and I may have some questions, maybe a question about something that I didn't fully understand or I'd like to learn more about later or maybe something that I just found really, really interesting uh, in the story as I'm reflecting back on it. So let's take a look here on page 12. And if you look there on page 12, the paragraphs are labeled. There's a tiny little number right out there. One, two, and three. So the paragraphs are labeled, okay? So we're going to read paragraphs one, two, and three. And before I start reading, I might have some questions about the story. I might wonder, hmm, I wonder when corn was first planted. Hmm. I might wonder how important was corn? Was it a big part of life for people? Um, you know, was it something that was grown frequently or did a lot of people grow it or was it not really that important? 
So as I'm reading, I might be generating some questions in my mind. And those questions will go down here in the green area where it says during reading. So as I'm going through the story, any questions that pop into my mind, I would want to add to that box. So let's take a look at paragraphs one through three on page 12 of A Short History of a Special Plant by Laura McDonald. Today, corn is the largest crop grown in the United States. Most years, American farmers produce more than $60 billion worth of corn. The story of how the United States became the biggest corn producer in the world began thousands of years ago in what is now Mexico. Corn, as we know it today, started out as a wild grass plant called, and then there's a word that has like slanted printing that's called italics, and the word is T-E-O-S-I-N-T-E. -E. And next to it, in those parentheses, it tells you how to pronounce the word. So if I sound this out, te-o-sin-ti. Te-o-sin-ti. That is how you pronounce that word. More than 5,000 years ago, Native Americans in what is now Mexico developed teosinti into maize or corn. An ear of teosinti only has a few kernels, while modern corn has hundreds of kernels. Maize spread through North and South America, and it became a major part of the Native American diet. Maize was an important crop to the first peoples of Central and North America. Early people used every part of the corn plant. They used the stalks to make roofs. The cobs were burned for fuel. They used the silk to fill beds. They braided the husks to make mats, beds, baskets, and dolls. The kernels were ground into cornmeal for cooking and baking. So I'm kind of wondering as I'm reading this, and I know in social studies, we're learning about Native Americans. So I'm kind of making a, a connection there, a text to world connection of history. And I'm wondering how did they grow enough corn to survive? Right, because if they were using it for food and for cooking and for fuel and to make all these other things, how were they able to grow enough? So that's a question that I'm going to put here in the during reading box. OK, um, I'm just wondering that and I'm, I'm hoping that they will explain that later in the story. OK, so now we're going to go on to the next page. And if you look over on page 13 and 14, page uh, 13 has paragraphs four and five, and page 14 has paragraph six. So let's continue reading on page 13, paragraph four, early cultivation. The first Native American corn farmers used the seeds from the healthiest corn plants to grow their crops. This selective breeding improved their crop yield. When farmers realized that they could plant a surplus of corn and not hurt their fields, they grew larger crops and stored the leftover corn as a food supply that could last during the winter months. The Native American planting system was called the Three Sisters Method. For centuries, early farmers planted their fields with the three plants, corn, squash, and beans together. Each plant helped the other grow, and the mixture of plants helped preserve nutrients in the soil. The advantages of planting the three crops together were tenfold. Corn was a strong and vertical plant that stood straight, so the beans could curl up around its stalk. In turn, the beans fixed nitrogen in their roots, helping restore the soil. Meanwhile, the squash leaves spread out on the ground and retained moisture in the soil for the other plants. They also helped to keep away pests. This mutually beneficial arrangement among the plants mimics the type of symbiosis found in nature. The end result was a healthy crop that yielded a variety of nutritious plants and also maintained the integrity of the soil. Now, I'm going to stop there for one second because there were some words in that paragraph that I was not familiar with. 
One of them was this phrase right here, mutually beneficial arrangement. This mutually beneficial arrangement among the plants. Hmm, what does that mean? Well, if I use my context clues, this mutually beneficial arrangement, I know that benefit means something good. So mutually beneficial arrangement, that might mean that all the plants are helping each other for the greater good. So all three plants are working together and they're all getting something good out of it. So I think that's what that means. Then there's another word, symbiosis. This mutually beneficial arrangement among the plants mimics the type of symbiosis found in nature. Hmm, I'm not sure what that word means. So I could use my context clues and try to figure it out. Um, it kind of seems like that goes along with mutually beneficial. So it sounds like other things in nature, maybe animals or other plants, also do that where they work together for the greater good. So I'm wondering, and I later on I'm going to show you what you can do if you're not sure what a word means. Okay? And the last word I wasn't sure of was this word. The end result was a healthy crop that yielded a variety of nutritious plants and also maintained the integrity of the soil. Hmm, integrity. I wonder what that means. Well, it sounds like the beans were putting nitrogen from the roots into the soil to help it, and the squash leaves were kind of covering the soil to keep out the pests and to keep moisture in. So I'm thinking that integrity must mean it's keeping the soil good. It's keeping the soil healthy. Now, if I look at this diagram here, you can see that it's labeled. There's the corn plant, nice and straight and tall. There's the bean plant that kind of wraps around the corn plant. And then down here are the squash. So you can see how those three sisters plants grow together. Okay, now, the last thing I'm going to read is paragraph six, which is on page 14. Europeans began to settle in North America in the 1600s. At first, maize was entirely unknown to them, but they quickly saw its value. The English called it corn because that is what they called all wheat and barley crops in England. Native Americans taught the settlers how to grow and care for the three sisters crops. The settlers recognized that maize was the key to their survival. In time, people around the world began to grow and eat maize. So I didn't know that the word corn came from the English settlers. It sounds like they called any crop that they grew corn. So when they came over to what is now North America and they saw this plant, they just called it corn because it went kind of along with the other plants that they grew in grains. So that was an interesting fact. So as I was reading, I did have a couple of questions, right? I, how did they store the extra corn? That was one of my questions, which they did kind of answer that. And my other question was, do people still use the three sisters planting system today? So I know in the summer, I love to go to Hunter's Farm. Their corn is delicious. It's my favorite. And I'm wondering, does Hunter's Farm use this three sisters planting system that has been around for thousands of years. So I would put those questions over here in the during reading box. Okay, for your first assignment, you are going to continue on and you're going to read the rest of the story, A Short History of a Special Plant. So you're going to read here on page 14. So you're gonna read this, page 15, and on to page 16. So you're going to read pages 14, 15, and 16. And while you are reading, you're going to write in the margin, this is the margin, okay, with your pencil, you're going to write at least three questions during your reading, okay? So as you're reading, you can just maybe write a question here, question here, question here. Write, write at least three questions that you have during your reading in the margins. And then on page 16, you're going to write at least two questions after you're done reading, okay? So that's five questions total, three during and two after. And you're doing this in your booklet with your pencil, 
okay? So go ahead and do that now. Read the rest of the story. Write three questions during and two questions after your reading in the margin, and you can stop the video and then come back when you're done. Okay, moving right along. So we're going to be looking at some words with long vowel syllable patterns, and we're also going to go back to that reading big words strategy. Remember I saw a word in the story that I wasn't sure what it meant. It was symbiosis. And I kind of got stumped on that a little bit. We'll talk about ways that you can sort of figure out the meaning of a word if you don't know it and you can't figure it out from the context clues. So here are some words with long vowel syllable patterns. And we had talked about long vowel syllable patterns way back in our review and routines. Okay, so we're going to review it now. And remember that long vowels are vowels that say their name, A, E, I, O, and U. So the words that I have here, my long vowel syllable words, are up in this purple shaded box. And you can see that there are 12 words total. So I'm going to read through them, and then I'll explain to you kind of how I group them. So I have bright, elevate, explained, exploded, human, obliged, payable, raised, reasonable, replied, way, and yielded. Hmm, yielded, I think I saw that word in the story. I think I saw the word yielded in the story. The words with the little stars are challenge words. That means they might be a little bit trickier than the others. So what I did here was I sorted the words according to the long vowel sound that they have. So all of the long A words are here in the blue. Now the long A sound can be spelled many different ways. It could be just a plain A with an E on the end, A-I, A-Y, or even E-I as in the word way. Then I have the long E words, replied, reasonable, yielded. And they are here in the yellow, and you can see that the long E sound can be spelled different ways. And then I have the long I sound, obliged and bright, down there in the green shaded area. And then I have the long O and the long U, exploded and human. So if I'm looking at these words and I'm not sure what the word is or if I a uh, word I've never seen before, I can look for the word parts. Remember we talked about prefixes and suffixes. So for example, the word exploded. Here's X, right? I recognize that prefix. And then on the end, there's the ED, ed. Able, I remember that suffix. There's able again. There's more ed, ed. So I could look and sort of see if I can sound out these words or see if I know any of the word parts. I might see this word and say, okay, burr. Hmm, I'm not sure about this part, but I know the word right. I know right and left. There's right, b, right, bright, and kind of blend it all together. So you might say the word out loud. If it doesn't sound right, you could try a different pronunciation. You can ask yourself, hmm, does that make sense? Does that sound like a real word? Now, if you're sounding out the words and you're thinking to yourself, I don't know what that word is. I don't know how to say it. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. I don't know what it means. We do have some references that you can use um, online references, and what we call print references, okay? So a print reference would be something that's like in a book, okay? A dictionary would be a print reference. Your reading booklet would be a print reference. Um, a poster in your classroom um, is a print reference. Uh, context clues will be a print reference. It's in the text. But sometimes that isn't enough and you need to look somewhere else. So you could look online. We have a lot of digital references. And here are some that I have linked. Um, Dictionary.com, wordcentral.com, kids.wordsmith.net, and Britannica Kids. So we're going to take a look at some words that might not be familiar and how you would use 
those digital references to find out how to say the word, how to pronounce the word, and what the word means. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually use um, a website to find the meaning of these words. So I chose the words elevate, obliged, where did it go? Payable, reasonable, and yielded. So when I go to a website, I'm just going to bring this back up for just a minute. If I go to a website like, let's go to dictionary.com. And when I pull up dictionary.com, I can type the word right up here in this box, okay? So I know that one of my words was elevate, so I'm going to type that in. And when I go down here, I see that this gives me a lot of information about the word elevate. If I'm not sure how to say it, look for this little speaker. Elevate. It will tell you how to say it. Elevate. There it is. Now, it will also give you the pronunciation. Elevate. There it is. It will give you um, what uh, part of speech it is. This is a verb. And then it will give you some meanings, okay? So this word says to move or raise to a higher place or position, to lift up. So elevate means to lift up or move something up. And it is a verb. Now, when I go back, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look up one more word just to show you another one. Let's go to kids.wordsmith.net. This is another online research, and I'm going to use the word obliged. So over here, you can type, and the definition will come up along with the pronunciation, and there's that little speaker. Oblige. Oblige. Obliged. Oblige. So it's telling me that it's a verb, it's giving me different forms of it. Our word is obliged with a D on the end. And it gives us some definitions. To make someone feel bound to do something or to act in a certain way. And then it gives you a sample sentence. So if you're still not sure, it will use the word in a sentence so that you can kind of also use the context clues. Their friendship obliged them to help each other. So that kind of means like because they're friends, they have to help each other. So let's go back and look at our slides. And I went ahead and I looked up some of these words on dictionary.com. And what I did was I made a little chart and I put, here's the word, there's the part of speech, and then I wrote the definition. And if I needed to, I wrote a sentence with the word in it to help me remember what it meant. So we said that elevate was a verb and it means to lift up or to make something higher. Um, it could also mean to raise in rank or importance, make something more important. Uh, the word obliged, we looked at that one to make someone feel bound to do something or act in a certain way. And there's the sentence with the word obliged in it. So if I'm not really sure, I can look at that sentence and use the context clues. Payable. Payable is an adjective. And I wrote the definition here in blue, due to be paid as a debt. Write the check payable to me. So it means payable means like you're paying somebody. You are um, paying money that you owe them. Reasonable is an adjective, using good sense and clear thinking. The judge made a reasonable decision after carefully listening to the case. So the word carefully tells me, hmm, reasonable has something to do with being careful. So that kind of helps also. And last is yielded. It is a verb, and it means to give forth or produce. Our garden yielded lots of vegetables this year. And when we were reading in our story, it said about it yielding a lot of corn, right? So the plants produced a lot of corn.
Okay, so those resources are there as digital resources if you do not know what a word means. Okay, so these long vowel syllable pattern words, some of them you might be familiar with, and some of them you might say, hmm, I'm not sure about that one. Right, and you can go back and look at those resources that I gave you to find out the meanings of those words. So your second assignment today is on a Google Doc that is linked with this assignment. And you're going to open up the Google Doc and you're going to choose six of those uh, long vowel syllable words. And you're going to write a sentence for each of the words that you chose. You're going to type that into the Google Doc. If you are not sure what a word means, then you could use one of those resources that I showed you. If you have a dictionary at home, um, if you wanna use the digital resources, you can look on one of those uh, links that I put on the slide before, um, but you can pick any six words you want. And when you're writing your sentences, make them good fifth grade sentences, right? Make them descriptive, make them interesting, use lots of words, make sure that your sentence has a subject, right, who or what the sentence is about, and what we call a predicate or what the subject does or says. So try to make your sentences more than just a couple of words. Make them really interesting for us to read. So your sentences will go down here on the Google Doc that is linked with this assignment under today's date. And you're going to make sure that you submit that or turn it in so that your teacher can check it, okay? So you can stop the video here and come back when you are done. Okay, our last part of our lesson today is my favorite part, and that is independent reading. So this is the time when you get to choose a book of your choice, and you get to take some time and just enjoy that book. Read, enjoy, read for pleasure, um, and make sure that you're kind of away from distractions, right? Put the phone down, step away from the TV, right? Turn the video game off, go somewhere quiet where you can focus on your book. And just take that 15 minutes or 10 minutes and read. And remember, if you'd like, you can set a timer. Um, you could use a, a, an egg timer, a phone timer, a microwave timer. But this is your turn to just read. And as you're reading, I challenge you to think back to what we talked about at the beginning of the lesson. Think about questions before you read, during, and after you're reading. Usually before I read, I try to think back on what I read the night before. And I think, oh, I wonder what's going to happen with that character. I wonder if she's going to go and get on the plane and fly to Paris, right? Or I wonder if I'm going to find out whatever happened in this mystery. Or am I going to find out, you know, are they going to solve the mystery in what I read tonight? So I'm already thinking of some questions. And then as I'm reading, I'm thinking of more questions. Sometimes there's a word I don't know. So guess what I do? I get my phone out and I will look up the word on a digital resource. I will look it up so that I, or they make a reference to something. They may reference something in history or a famous person that I'm not familiar with. And I'll look it up so that I can better understand the story. So you can do that too. So try to think of some questions before, during, and after your independent reading. Enjoy, and I will see you next time. Bye.